It's Miller time. USC football is set for spring action. USC baseball's inconsistent ways continue to plague them. And Thomas and Will's picks for Trojan of the Week are in to find out who is next on Sports Scene. Welcome back to Sports Seed. I'm Grace Schneider. I'm Terrence Holton. And I'm Casey Kasliner. Trojan football is back. USC's annual spring game is set to kick off this Saturday. Here's what quarterback Miller Moss had to say about his, exp his expectations for the exhibition match. I think we just want to put the work we've put in on, on display for the for the world to see. I mean, in reality, we shouldn't make it more than practice 15 for us, but um, obviously a uh, good opportunity for guys to get their first chance to play in the college and compete and stuff like that. So excited to put what we've done on, on display for the world. Fans will have their eyes on Moss, who shined in the Trojans' last game of the season, the Holiday Bowl. The redshirt sophomore threw for six touchdowns on 372 yards and a 69.7 completion rate en route to an offensive slugfest for USC. Given how poorly the Trojan defense performed last season, the new and improved coaching staff will also have a chance to show the revamped squad. Defensive coordinator Danson Lynn brought along some of UCLA's defensive talents like safety Kamari Ramsey and cornerback John Humphrey. Easton Mascarenas Arnold and Nate Clifton could also be catalysts, especially considering the Trojans' recent transfer portal losses in Isaiah Rakes and Traquan Fagans. So which facet of USC football are you guys most excited for in the showcase on Saturday? You know, Casey, you mentioned it earlier, Miller Moss. I'm really excited for the passing game in general because Moss is obviously fantastic, played great in the Holiday Bowl, but I'm looking forward to seeing a bit of Jaden Maiava, the UNLV quarterback transfer. Threw for over 3,000 yards with the running Rebels last season. I'm really excited to see if he will compete for this job against Moss. I think defense is the big question here. Yeah, the quarterback side is really interesting, but we've had a lot of big shifts in the defensive coaching staff. So uh, we have to give them a benefit of the doubt. They haven't really had a, enough time to get their feet set, really secure those players that they want. But, you know, we hope to see some kind of progress there. Of course. Well, of course, US USC lost Brendan Rice and Todd Washington. So it really makes this wide receiver room a lot younger. But, of course, you're going to have second years for Zachariah Branch, Deuce Robinson, and I, I think it could be a really, really big turnaround for this wide receiver room that, of course, suffered last year without Jordan Addison. I'm also looking forward to see Xavier Jordan, who was a highly touted recruit. Obviously, he probably won't see the field much in his freshman year, but I'm really excited to see what he can do here. And Makai Lemon, who also had a really good holiday bowl. So we'll see what happens. Ready for football to be back? Well, one of our reporters sat down with USC's new starting quarterback. Today, I'm here with junior quarterback Miller Moss. Thank you so much for coming on Sports Scene. Thank you so much for having me. How are you doing today, Miller? Fantastic. How are you? I'm <laughs> good. Thank you for coming. Um, so to get started, I want to ask you a little bit about your path and just what brought you to USC. Yeah. Um, great question. So I, I grew up a, a big SC fan. Obviously, I'm from the area, so I'm probably 20, 25 minute drive from campus. So um, growing up, there was no pro um, NFL team in Los Angeles. So it was really rooted for the Lakers in basketball and then USC football was the professional football team in the area. So yeah. um, they were obviously great when I was growing up, and I love the program and obviously the school as well and have made great relationships since I've been here. So very happy with my choice. So let's talk about what everyone has been talking about recently, and that's been your Holiday Bowl performance. <laughs> so this was your first start, um, and then you ended up throwing for six touchdowns, which is the most touchdown passes in a Holiday Bowl. Um, most in a USC bowl game, and then tied the Pac-12 bowl game passing touchdown record. What was that game like for you? Yeah, I mean, it was awesome. It was the culmination of a, of a lot of work. Um, but I think the, the biggest thing there was how we came together as a team throughout that, that bowl prep period. I think it was really cool to see. Um, obviously, we had a lot of key departures, so it was interesting. I was curious to see how our team would respond. Um, from that and how we would handle that adversity, and I was, I was really proud of the guys and how we came together. Absolutely. And did you have, like, a favorite moment from that game? I mean, I, like, the whole game was just fun. I mean, obviously, like, right. like <laughs> sitting for a while is, is frustrating, so getting to actually play the game is, is awesome. But I think, like, when you're in the middle of the game, you don't appreciate it. And I think being able to go out there and, and take the knee to, to finish the game and then just kind of being able to celebrate and enjoy that moment with my teammates was definitely the highlight. Definitely. So... Obviously, you know, you played alongside Caleb Williams for two years. What did you learn from him, and what are you going to take from him going forward? 
um, as you know, you go on next season without him around. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, um, like you said, like I sat behind Caleb for two years, which was frustrating, but also like a great learning experience for me. Um, in my mind, like if I was going to sit behind someone, I might as well sit behind someone who's a Heisman Trophy winner and <laughs> going to be the number one overall pick. So <laughs> um, there's some silver lining to that, but um, I think just the the competitor that he was and the leader that he was like I, I can take a ton from that obviously in terms of physically playing the game he's mm -hmm. one of the most talented people to uh to do that on the on the planet at the moment so um <laughs> definitely a lot of things that i could take from him in that respect but um he's someone that that I, i've grown really close with i think we worked really well together which is why why we had success off i'm mean, not the main reason why we had success but definitely contributed to our success on offense that we were able to work so well together um and yeah, just really looking forward to, to follow, following in his footsteps and leading the team as best I can. Definitely. So obviously, we are joining the Big Ten yes. in August. What are you most looking forward to with that transition? Yeah, I mean, I think just, just the environments like we were talking before, just like being able to go into Michigan and play. I mean, obviously, they're the defending national champion, champions, but <laughs> just being able to go, go across the country and play, some of the, play in some of these venues and against some of these opponents that we have not had the opportunity to do so in, in a long time. I'm really excited for that. Um, and just playing on a national stage each and every week is why you come to USC. So. Definitely. Definitely. Very, very excited. I know spring practices started recently. What have you guys, you know, mainly been working on as a team and prep for the fall? Yeah, I mean, spring's always an interesting period, right, because you have so long until the season. So I think spring is really about, like, finding our, our identity on offense, obviously, and then as a team as a whole, um, and then really highlighting the areas that we have to get better at, get better at, obviously, through the spring period, and then summer going into camp. So um, I think we started off on, on a positive note and looking to continue to build on that. Um, obviously, can't wait to get to, to the fall. Well, Miller, thank you so much for coming, and I'm so excited for the upcoming season. Yeah, me too. Thank you for having me. Of course. With the spring game this Saturday, I'm excited what Miller and the rest of the team will bring to the table. The transfer portal opened back up for college football this past Monday, and the Trojans have already lost multiple players. The players in the transfer portal include freshman offensive lineman Jason Zamandella, senior defensive lineman Isaiah Rakes, and sophomore cornerback Traquan Fingus. Both Zamandella and Rakes had only been on campus for three months as Zamandella enrolled early and Rakes transferred from Texas A&M this past year. While the transfer portal has not been productive so far for the Trojans, never doubt Lincoln Riley when it comes to wooing players to the Trojans. On Monday evening, two former USC women's basketball players were selected in the third round of the WNBA draft, guard Mackenzie Forbes and forward Caitlin Davis. Forbes was the Trojans' reliable second scoring option this past season, and she'll head down Figueroa to join the LA Sparks. Named the Pac-12 tournament's most outstanding player, the grad transfer averaged 14 points per game and was a main contributor to USC's Elite Eight run. Forbes was picked 28th overall. Hey Trojan fans, it's Kenzie Forbes here. Uh, thank you for your support all season long. Super excited to get started on the next step of my journey and excited to be staying here in LA. So y'all got to pull up to the Sparks games. Fight on. Caitlin Davis had her name called at pick 35 by the league runner-up New York Liberty. Like Forbes, Davis was a, was a key player in the Trojan starting lineup, especially on the defensive end. Davis will join Brianna Stewart and Sabrina Ionescu on a star-studded team expecting a deep run. The draft was headlined by undisputed top pick Caitlin Clark, who was followed by Stanford star Cameron Brink and recent national championship winner Camilla Cardoso. The Sparks also acquired the fourth overall pick from Seattle, allowing them to take Rakea Jackson, and J.C. Sheldon landed with the Dallas Wings at fifth overall. So, this is one of the best WNBA draft classes of all time, maybe the best ever. How do you guys think it's going to affect the league's popularity for years to come? I think it's greatly going to affect them. I mean, let's be honest, Caitlin Clark... Uh, every every single person in this draft, draft class, Camila Cardoso, they're all so popular. You look at the ratings for women's college basketball this year, they're through the roof. So I really just think this can do nothing but good for the league. Yeah, the dynamic of women's basketball, and honestly, it's trickling into other women's sports as well. It's all changing. There's more eyes. I think players like Caitlin Clark, Juju Watkins, and Angel Reese, it's becoming more of a player-centered game, and that's what's attracting all these viewers. So... I hope that, you know, the potential new popularity coming in from Caitlin Clark won't be short-lived. We'll see if it is for the WNBA, but I think it'll definitely be a positive and, and help, like, bolster the WNBA. And, I, and, of course, the league is growing in, in itself, right? Next year, expanding to the Bay Area. And I think, you know, we talked about this before on past shows, but 
Of course, the women's side has something the men's side hasn't had in recent years, and that's sort of marinating the success of these players for years to come. Caitlin Clark has been a highly touted name for multiple years, Angel Reese, other players as well, Camilla Cardoso. And on the men's side, it's a lot of one and done. So people don't necessarily know these names. Caitlin Clark had her jersey sell out in multiple sizes on draft night. I mean, that just it doesn't happen so usually. So I never, think it's, it never happens. It's never happened, at least on the women's side. So I'm really excited for what's to come. And I, I think, yeah, from a marketing standpoint and on court standpoint, I think it's huge for the league. I mean, Casey, just to add on that one more thing, the Indiana Fever have already sold out multiple games just in preparation for Caitlin Clark's arrival. I mean, it's going to be incredible what they've already done for the league. It's going to be so fun watching them play. It definitely will be fun. And I hope I hope this continues on for years to come. 100%. Yeah, well, now we'll send it over to our quarrelsome colleagues to discuss this week's stout performers. Will and I are so captivating, we've been moved up to A Block for Trojan of the Week. We're both drawing from the same well that we had last week. I'm choosing Catherine Park from Women's Golf. Catherine Park saved the Trojans from blowing a nine-stroke lead at the Silverado Showdown. She was the only golfer at the tournament to shoot under par in all three rounds, and the Pac-12 announced yesterday that her strong performance earned her Pac-12 Golfer of the Week honors. And I'm staying on the diamond this week to take the Trojans' leadoff man, Austin Overn. Overn made his presence felt in USC's weekend up in Oregon, especially in Game 3 on Sunday. He got his team on the board with a solo shot to right, and then robbed a potential dinger himself with a leaping catch in center field. Those two runs made all the difference in a 4-2 win for the Trojans. All right, Thomas, you're hitting the links once again. Why are you going uh, with Park? Park did everything to help the Trojans get that. Uh, that title at the Silverado Showdown. Obviously, they shared the team title, but USC was leading by nine strokes heading into that day, and they almost blew it. The only reason they didn't completely blow it was because Park was there to shoot under par for all three days. That was your biggest concern about my choice for Shoemaker last year, last week. She didn't win, and she didn't shoot under par all three days. Park did both of those things. She won, and she shot under par. Yeah, great performance, no question. But you talk about what an effort you would not have won without. Let's talk about Austin over an in-game three. Robbed home run, saved a run. Home run got you a run. They won by two, and that was a crucial game for USC to take, especially in a road season. That's what played them last year. They couldn't win those three games when they were down 2 nothing. This week they did, and they would not have done it without Oh, oh they won? Well, let's talk about game one and game two, because... You want to talk about Austin Overn's performance? He had errors in both of those games. In both of those innings where he had the errors, Oregon scored a run. They scored four runs in the first game when he had an error, scored another run in the other game when he had an error. So if you want to talk about performances, Overn did not help his team win in the first two games. They partially lost because of his performance. Yeah, no question game one wasn't great, but in his most recent three, he is, his slash line is a 500 batting average and a 642 on base percentage with four runs. That's exactly what you want from your leader uh, from your leadoff Did hitter. Did they win? I, I, think, I think what you want exactly from your leadoff hitter is to have him help you win. And the Trojans didn't win in the first two games. And they lost against San Diego last night. Well, it was one and three this week. Will. It's tough to blame a guy who had a 500 average and walked a lot. And look, I, I know you don't want to give a lot of credit for walks, but hey, as Brad Pitt said in Moneyball, if you get on base, do I care if it's a walk or a hit? Well, I do not. I, I care about playing good defense. And he had two errors. He has three errors all year. Two of them were this past week. We're talking about Catherine Park, who was the Pac-12 golfer of the week. There were six people nominated for baseball Pac-12 player of the week. Over and not on that list. How can you choose somebody who is not even in consideration for a player of the week when Catherine Park won it outright? I don't care about the awards, but that, that's your business. Oh, oh, I care about the awards because it shows what these players are doing. Overn didn't do enough to help his team win. They went one and three. Park did everything she could to help her team win. She won the individual title and she helped her team win the title too. I think that's enough to earn Trojan of the Week. But men's volleyball starts their postseason tonight. We will unpack their matchup after the break. The number two ranked beach volleyball team takes on number one UCLA in a crosstown battle for the books. Let me tell you how we amplify our Latine voices. Check out Dimelo. We have it all. Deportes. Entertainment. Noticias. ¿Qué tal? Soy Mariela Gómez y bienvenidos a Dime la Hora. Radio and Podcasting. Comida y Cultura. 
digital social media. ¿A qué equipo le vas tú? LA Galaxy o LAFC? Dímelo, es la única Latina Focus Media Outlet at USC. Dímelo, we have it all. Dímelo, Dímelo. we have it all. Mr. Owl, how many licks does it take to get to the Tootsie Roll Center of a Tootsie Pop? Let's find out. One, two, three. How many licks does it take to get to the center of a Tootsie Pop? The world may never know. There's a new pet. Ch -ch -ch Chia. Chia pet. The pottery that grows. It's fun and easy. Soak your chia, spread the seeds, keep it watered, and watch it grow. And now grow a whole collection of fun with Chia teddy bears. Puppies, kittens, rams, bulls. There's even a Chia tree to keep your pets company. Chia Pets and Trees, the pottery that grows. The Chia Pet and Chia Tree are available at Kmart, Rite Aid, Ames, and Woolworth. Makes a great gift. After a weekend in Eugene, USC Baseball won one out of three games against the Ducks. Number 18 Oregon nearly swept the Tro Trojans, but they fought back, earning a 42 victory on Sunday. Sophomore outfielder Austin Overn scored three out of the four runs to help USC pull out a win in the series finale at Oregon. However, the Trojans ca couldn't carry their momentum to their game against San Diego last night as they fell 3-2. to two. Today, the Trojans have an opportunity to gain a ranked win as they will travel to face number 17, UC Irvine. Looking ahead to this weekend, USC will host unranked Santa Clara and Sacramento State. With an overall losing record of 17 and 19, the Trojans will need to capitalize on these next few games to improve their record and prepare for the upcoming Pac-12 conference matchups. The MPSF Volleyball Tournament begins today at the Galen Center with the first game between one-seeded Grand Canyon and seven-seeded Concordia University Irvine. Sophomore outside hitter Dylan Klein was named all-conference second team for the MPSF on Tuesday. The Trojans went 3-9 and nine in conference play and finished as the sixth seed, second to lowest in the MPSF. Klein and the Trojans will likely have to win out if they want a berth in the NCAA Tournament. The NCAA tournament begins in less than two hours as Grand Canyon takes on Concordia University Irvine. After that, USC versus BYU, then the final game of the night of Stanford against Pepperdine. Crosstown rival UCLA wrapped up the one seed in the MPSF, securing a first round bye. Meanwhile, the Trojans finished second to last and will have to scrap and claw their way to an NCAA tournament bid. The Trojans will take on the BYU Cougars, the team which USC upset just two weeks ago. The Trojans knocked off BYU in a thrilling five-set match on April 6th, just, days a just a day after succumbing to 1-3 to the Cougars. If the Trojans pull off the upset, a matchup with crosstown rival UCLA is looming. The Trojans will likely need to win out if they want to make an, an appearance in the NCAA tournament. This Thursday, USC Beach Volleyball has their senior day to celebrate their eldest players' last games in Merle Nor Norman Stadium. USC fifth-year twin sisters and three-time national champions Audrey and Nicole Norse express their gratitude for the USC Beach Volleyball program. Tomorrow, I think we're just going to really just embrace the moment, be present, enjoy it. Um, it's our last time playing at Merle Norman, which is crazy to say. Um, and so I, I think overall, we're just going to have a lot of fun and give it our best, give it our best shot. I haven't really, we both haven't thought too much about it being our last game. Um, but I think it'll definitely be bittersweet. Like we've just done so much uh, here over the last five years and it's just been such a pleasure. So I'm sure that it'll be a, a wave of mixed emotions, a lot of gratitude. I'm sure there'll be some tears, um, but ultimately I think it'll be a really, really fun day um, and it'll be a full circle moment for sure. After a tight battle, number two USC fell to number one UCLA in a 3-2 loss at the Center of Effort Challenge final last Saturday. At the top court, USC's All-American seniors Megan Kraft and Delaney Maple defeated UCLA's Maggie Boyd and Lexi Danaberg in a three-set thriller. However, the Trojans still came up short. Despite their loss in the first place duel, the Trojans swept number five TCU and number seven Long Beach State 5-0. USC Beach Volleyball is still holding steady at the number two spot in the AVCA Collegiate Beach Poll. UCLA currently holds the top spot with Stanford at number three and Florida State and Cal Poly tied for the fourth rank. On Thursday, the Trojans will face number nine LMU and they will have another opportunity to take down the number one Bruins. 
With the Pac-12 championship rapidly approaching, the Trojans will need to capitalize on their ranked game opportunities. Next, we'll preview the quest for Lord Stanley. Casey and I will preview our picks for the Western Conference Final. Bonjour, je suis le grand musée. Je suis la jeune fille. Yes, that's French they're speaking. And no, these children aren't French. They're American. And they've acquired their amazing new language skills from Muzzy, the remarkable new video language program for children developed by the British Broadcasting Corporation. With this unique BBC language course, children learn a second language with incredible ease. Four delightful videos quickly become their favorite TV show and teaches children the same way they learned English. Learning another language becomes fun. You'll be amazed when your children begin speaking and understanding their new language from the very first day through this unique method. The entire course, four videos, two audio cassettes, the activity book, and the parent's guide and answer book is available in French, Spanish, Italian, or German. To order, use your credit card and call this number. We'll ship and charge you $28.08 a month for six months. Your satisfaction is guaranteed. Call 1-800-424-0700. Okay, this stuff is really amazing. I mean, I put it in my mouth and I taste what, watermelon, but it's not just that. I taste strawberry too, but it's kind of like a watermelony strawberry put together. Hey, uh oh, hang on. Sorry about that. And the bubbles are really awesome. I mean, that's why they call it Max, I guess, obviously. I, that sort of makes sense once you think about it. Oh, I'm Dan, and uh, that's Chuck. Hubba Bubba Max. A whole new kind of bubble. Hey! The first two games of the NBA play-in were last night, with the Lakers advancing to round one. And the Pelicans and Kings set for a fate-deciding second play-in round. So Terrence and I are going to go over the Western Conference side of the bracket. Of course, New Orleans is li listed here as the eighth seed, but that could be Sacramento, depending on what happens in that final play-in game. Terrence, who do you have in a first-round matchup between Oklahoma City and either New Orleans or Sacramento? Yeah, Casey, I really don't think it matters who wins the New Orleans-Sacramento game. I'm going to take Oklahoma City to win this. I think they are a great team. Chet Holmgren, Shea Gilgis Alexander, fantastic team. I have them advancing to the second round. Well, a young, good team for sure. Now, moving down a little bit, the Clippers and Mavericks, I'm going to go with an upset here. It's a 4-5 matchup. Luka Doncic, I think he's winning MVP. You have Kyrie Irving. Mm -hmm. Clippers are a good team, but they've been inconsistent a bit this year, and they haven't fared well in the playoffs in recent years. I agree. They're a little injury-prone, and I like that upset a lot. It's going to be a great game either way, no matter what. Then heading down here, Phoenix and Minnesota. Another tough game. Phoenix is really star-studded. Minnesota's young, unexperienced, but they're really close. But I'm going to lean with Phoenix. I think the Suns are overall a better team. Kevin Durant, Bradley Beal, Devin Booker. I'm going to take Phoenix to advance the second round. Well, it would be a disservice to not pick the defending NBA champs to make it out of the first round. The Lakers barely won the play-in game last night. I have Denver making it to round two. You know, Casey, I agree with you there, but I do think if the Lakers can find a way to beat Denver, I truly think that they can go all the way, no matter what. Well, okay, who do you have in the second round then? Okay, second round, I am going, this is a really tough one. Oklahoma City and Dallas is what we have. I'm going to take the Thunder. I still Ooh. think the Thunder are a great team. I have them edging out the Luka Doncic and Kyrie Irving. I really think that they're a great team, well-coached, Young, I know they're unexperienced, but so is Dallas. I'm going to take Oklahoma City. Yeah, I don't know about that one, but Phoenix and Denver, I'm still taking Denver. I, I know I agree. the big three is really good, but like, like I said, you have Nikola Jokic on your team, you're going to make it at least past round two. All right, then last one here. We got the one versus the two. It's a little basic matchup, but one versus two. They're by far the best teams. Let's decide this together. Who do you think is going to win? I got to go with a Thunder. Really? Oh, you know? I'm going to go Denver. I think Denver, they are the reigning champs, and you really can't take that for granted. They are overall, their experience, they basically brought back a, the exact same team, minus Bruce Brown, of their major contributors. I'm going to take the Thunder in this one. Excuse me, the, the Nuggets. Yeah, but the Thunder are so deep, and they're so, I know they're young, but they have arguably, you know, the second best rookie. They're such a deep team, so young, and if they don't win it, I think they're going to win for years to come, make it to the finals eventually. All right, well, we are divided on this one. Either way, I think whoever wins the West is going to end up being the East champion. I think the East is a little weak this year. But now we'll send it back to Grace to discuss the Clippers' key matchup with the Dallas Mavericks. Thanks, guys. The NBA playoffs have begun, with the play-in games in the West starting yesterday. However, the fourth-seeded Clippers have a tough matchup on their hands. The Clippers will face the fifth-seeded Dallas Mavericks in the first round of the NBA playoffs. The Clippers, despite assembling a star-studded roster, initially struggled before finding mid-season success only to falter due to injuries. 
Despite a rocky start, the Dallas Mavericks reconfigured their roster around Luka Doncic and Kyrie Irving, securing a fifth seed after a successful stretch. Centering around the star duo helped turn this team's performance around. In the playoffs, the Clippers and Mavericks have played against each other twice, where the Clippers won both series. Now with arguably their most star-studded roster in years, the Clips will have to get by Luka Doncic and company. During the matchup, all eyes will be on Luka Doncic and Kyrie, Ky, Kyrie Leonard. Leonard is a lockdown defender. However, Doncic has easily been the best scorer in the NBA, averaging over 33 points a game. While this matchup is likely to get heated, the other LA team has just advanced past the play-in. The playoff play-in has been controversial, so should the NBA just get rid of it altogether? Absolutely. I think it's a little ridiculous, if we're being completely honest. This is one of those situations where if it ain't broke, don't fix it. And I just think that the NBA added something. This is for money. They added more viewers. Oh, people can get excited about the playoffs. I think it's ridiculous. I think it only works if the conference is actually good, right? It works in the West because you have teams like Golden State, Sacramento, LA, New Orleans. Those are all good teams, really. And to think that two of them wouldn't have made the playoffs under a different format... To me, it wouldn't be fair. But you look at the East, where there's two teams with losing records in the play-in? That's ridiculous. Those teams don't deserve a platform. I, I think it's ridiculous in the East. I think in the West it works. So my conclusion is, if it's a good conference, it's good. If it's a bad conference, it's not. Terrence, let me ask you this. Do you enjoy the madness of March? That's a great question, Grace. Yes, I do. And why do you enjoy the madness of March? There's so many upsets. Because of the madness. You can't get rid of the play-ins. It's, it's a wild card situation, and that's what makes these, keeps these games fresh, makes them entertaining. It, basketball is a kind of sport that could go either way, in some cases, depending on the day. So I, I don't think you should abolish this. Brings in more viewers. That's a good thing, and I, it just keeps the game fresh. You know, Grace, I agree, but your Atlanta ha Hawks have no business <laughs> being in the playoffs whatsoever. I think they are a team that doesn't deserve to be there and I think it should just be one through eight but they could prove themselves you don't but know they won't. but I, ma maybe they are I, that they secret team that no, can win the entire no, thing no not gonna happen well, well let's send it over to the couch to discuss the NLH playoffs just two days separate us from the end of the NHL regular season after a chaotic night on Tuesday the four first round matchups in the Eastern Conference are now set in stone Two spots were up for grabs at the start of the week. The New York Islanders won their way in on Monday night against Jersey, while the Capitals, aided by an early goalie pull by John Tortorella, got the two points last night to earn that second wild card. The West has a handful of teams that could make a run, with the third spot in the Pacific still up for grabs. So, Will, in the Eastern Conference, which first-round series are you looking forward to the most? I'm looking at the two versus three in the Atlantic Division. The Boston Bruins taking on the Toronto Maple Leafs. Casey, that's two teams with a lot of pressure to win. And you look at Toronto, great offense. We all know William Nylander, Mitch Marner, Austin Matthews got 69 goals. But the, always the demise of the Toronto Maple Leafs in the postseason is on the back end in goal as well. And I look at this uh, series, you have one goalie in Toronto, Ilya Samsonov, with a goals against average above Three, and I've got for Boston, Linus Olmark, who since the All-Star break, goals against average below two. Boston will be better in their own end. That's why they'll win the series. Yeah, well, in the West, I have two teams that actually missed the playoffs last year but have proved themselves this year, Vancouver and Nashville. Vancouver has dominated the Predators in three head-to-head -head matchups, so 3-0 and against them, 13-5 to in goals. But J JT Miller is the X factor for me. He's been a point per game player since March 23rd. And also, though, the even bigger X factor for Vancouver, Thatcher Demko is coming back. Obviously, having Casey DeSmith in net has been rocky for Vancouver, to say the least. Demko is one of the best goaltenders in the NHL. He had 39 saves against Calgary in his return. I think he's going to be the X factor. And, of course, Quinn Hughes. I'm expecting him to have a big series. I know, look, Nashville, very, very good team. They've had, they were the best team in February and for part of March as well. But they've been shaky lately, and I'm taking the team that won the Pacific. It would be an upset if Nashville won, but give me, the, give me the Canucks in six games, honestly. Yeah, take it from me as a guy who's seen it. Barry Trotz teams, I don't care what happened in the regular season head-to-head. -head, they show up in the postseason. I would watch out for Nashville like I told you last week. But that is going to do it from all of us here at Sports Scene. Uh, I'm Will Camardella. And I'm Casey Kaslinner. We'll be here one more time, same place, next week for the last time this semester.